Thank you very much for giving me a couple of minutes. I it's know you're a busy pleasure. here. You're doing lots of things at this meeting. It's a very good meeting too. Um, we've had uh, a number of radiation therapists talking about um, radio surgery in the prostate and um, adjuvant uh, radiation after surgery mm. in high-risk patients. We've had no discussion whatsoever about advanced prostate cancer. And so I'm hoping that you're going to illuminate us. So you've been talking about um, adjuvant, uh, androgen deprivation therapy. Mm -hmm. um, t tell us about the setting of um, metastatic advanced uh, prostate cancer and, and the, the problem, because it is a problem. I think it's a real problem. Um, and although the incidence of being diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer is reducing, there are still too many men who are being diagnosed with bone metastases or who are indeed progressing to get bone metastases. And for this group, without doubt, hormone treatment remains the mainstay of therapy. And it seems quite amazing that it's over 70 years ago that Huggins and Hodges, Hug Huggins and Hodges recognised the relationship between testosterone and hormone levels and prostate cancer. And here we sit today still thinking about it and still getting quite excited about hormone treatment. Well, we think, we, we think of targeted therapy as new molecules and mm. uh, new antibodies, but actually targeted therapy has been going for a rather long time. And in breast cancer, it was 1896, wasn't it? Yes. The, uh, George Beetson's paper in The Lancet on um, deprivation of estrogen. So, so the, the things are moving along because it seems as if it's an area which is sorted <clears throat> and um, a lot of people get um, androgen deprivation treatment and then they become resistant and then there's not much else mm. except maybe there's a, a new idea that maybe androgen resistance isn't really androgen resistance because there's other drugs coming along which actually can sort that. Can you clear up that mess for me? Um, well, I think obviously the initial and gold standard treatment is removing the testicles and removing testosterone completely. And then we've been through oestrogens, which had cardiovascular side effects, which need to be managed. We've had the LHRH agonists, which are very good treatment for metastatic disease. The two potential drawbacks is that there can be a testosterone surge with the first injection. Um, and so an anti-androgen to block the effects of that testosterone surge needs to be given before and after just the initial injection. Um, and, and also increasingly has been recognized testosterone microsurges during treatment. Mm -hmm. And the clinical significance of that is, is uncertain, but I think it's something that really needs to be looked into because you want to keep a low castrate level of testosterone yeah. throughout therapy, otherwise you could be stimulating the cancer. Yeah. The other is sort of exciting news that we're, there's still new hormone therapies mm. coming through. Sure. Abiraterone, MDV3100, phase three studies, I think the abiraterone data is about to be reported, which we're all very excited about. Um, and MDV3100, another type of antiandrogen which is being investigated. So the hormone story is not closed. It's still open and there's still a lot of work going on in that area. And you've been working with another one? Yes. The I don't know the name, I can't pronounce it properly. Degorelix. <laughs> Degorelix. Degorelix. It's a GnRH receptor blocker. So rather than being an agonist, it is an antagonist. Right. And the ad potential advantages of this drug is that it causes immediate reduction in testosterone. In the study, I think 96% of people had castrate levels in three days, which is we're getting back to our roots, we're getting back to orchidectomy without obviously removing the testicles, which most people don't particularly want to have done. Um, there was a study, the CS21, which compared Degorelix to an LHRH agonist, Lupulide, and it was a non-inferiority study, and Degorelix was shown to be equally non effective, non equal. Yeah. Um, which was very encouraging. The potential advantages of having an antagonist are that there is no testosterone surge, mm. so you don't need an antiandrogen. And you know, many people would say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm used to giving antiandrogen, does that matter? But it's certainly, it's certainly easier for the patient that they can have treatment straight away. It was shown to have this immediate reduction in testosterone, and also the PSA levels became lower at 14 days much more quickly than with the agonists. But I think the interesting thing is there were no microsurges. And that is something that, you know, you think you know everything about metastatic mm. disease, but suddenly we're thinking again. And though it wasn't the primary endpoint, there were two quite interesting little facts that came out in the study on the analysis. One was that there was an improvement in progression-free survival yep. with Degorelix over mm. Lupralide. 
And the other thing, there was a significant reduction in musculoskeletal events. Okay. Now, whether that's due to cancer or the effects of the hormone treatment themselves, obviously they can have their own implications. The effects of the treatment themselves should be equal in, in both yeah. groups because they're both castrated. Yeah. Overall survival, presumably, is the same. Is it, it was only for a year, so there was no difference in overall survival. It was too early. But they're just little things that mm, I think yeah. need to be investigated further. And that's all moving on. The, the, just, just, uh, mm. just one other sort of little area in, 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 in that really requires touching on because it's hit the newspapers lately, and that's bisphosphonate. Yes. And where are you with bisphosphonate? Do you think these are automatic... Uh, choice for um, prophylaxis of bone problems or, or it's obvious that it can be used for treatment but, mm. but where are you on the prophylaxis and the reason that it's hit the headlines of course is this report that the longer term bisphosphonates doubles the rate of esophagus cancer which is mm. uh, perverse. Yeah, I don't quite understand that really no, but, but, um, but, but so I, 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 I won't, I won't mm. mention that. Um, I think for a, a group of patients certainly the study by Fred Saad which looked at zoledronic acid was positive. Mm -hmm. um, there are other studies going on looking at the effects of zoledronic acid in that setting and I think maybe we need more data from, from those studies from trapeze and stampede which are going on in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have denosumab sure. which is sort of going forward which in this had, had a head to head with zoledronic acid. Mm -hmm. So I think again it's a sort of slightly open field mm -hmm. and I think we probably need a little bit more data. Mm -hmm. But I know it, it, it is very commonly used, and personally, I, I, I would use it mm. for to delay and, and prevent skeletal-related events. Heather, thank you very much indeed it's for bringing pleasure. me up to date and bringing everybody else up to date. It's a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.